CCP's great plan to take over the world is failing spectacularly. Belt and Road Initiative has suffered yet another blow. The Philippines has decided to exit it. Italy, the G7 member to join China's Belt and Road, is dumping China's biggest international project. Many Belt and Road participants have been struggling to pay back billions in loans. Many of China's loans have fared badly. Is this the beginning of the end of BRI? Italy was one of the most important members of CCP's Belt and Road Initiative, as it was the only country from the G7 in there. But now, Italy is pulling out of BRI and starting a domino effect that will kill all of CCP's hopes and dreams of taking over the world. But BRI was destined to fail long before Italy's withdrawal, as many countries had figured out CCP's sinister motives behind the project. And they had started preemptively killing BRI before CCP had a chance to take over the country. Here are two pictures to show the downfall of BRI. Here's the member picture at the start of the project. And here's a time lapse of member pictures from last three years. Every year, more and more countries drop out. Soon, it will just be Xi and Putin left standing at the BRI grave. So, let's get into why countries are leaving BRI and what this means for the future of CCP. First, please, please take a second to hit the like button below. CCP bots are not happy when we cover China. And often, videos are downloaded by the bots to kill it in the algorithm. So your likes help us out a lot. Let's start. I know the first question everyone is going to have is, why was Italy in Belt and Road to begin with? If you know anything about Belt and Road Initiative, you know China is purposefully targeting low-income countries. So let's first dig into Italy's reasoning behind joining before we get into why many other countries, including Italy, are wanting out of BRI. Italy joined the venture back in 2019, long after the program was started. So we have to back up a little to 2019 and look at Italy's economic and political climate during that time to understand the motivation behind joining. Italy always had an economic relationship with China. In 1980s, Romano Prodi, future Prime Minister of Italy, was the president of Italy's Institute for Industrial Reconstruction. This is when China asked him to build a factory in Tianjin. In return, his Chinese counterparts helped him build a factory in what was then the Soviet Union. Once he became the prime minister in 1997, Prodi led a massive trade mission to China, bringing over 100 companies to promote joint ventures in engineering, pharmaceutical, food, textile, fashion, and finance. Most Italian prime ministers since then have shared Prodi's warmth towards China. CCP's launch of BRI only made this relationship more enticing for Italian, at least at the time. They noticed that whenever China invested in a European country, that country saw a massive uptick in economic activity in short term. We'll dig more into this point later in the video. For now, a great example of this was when a Chinese shipping company bought a controlling stake in the Greek port of Piraeus in 2016. Maritime transport is an important part of the BRI because the vast majority of China-Europe trade travels on ships. After China acquired the port of Piraeus, 13% of Chinese trade passed through Greece, compared to just 2% seven years earlier. Italy feared that if it stayed out of the BRI, it could miss trade opportunities and may even lose business as it gets stolen by other countries in BRI. Specifically, Italian ports on Adriatic Sea could lose business should the port of Piaras become linked to Central Europe via rail. Because this would mean that the trade bypassed Italy entirely instead of landing in Italian ports and being transported by Italian railways. Italy also hoped that with signing into BRI, they would fix the imbalance in trade between China and Italy. At the time, China was exporting heavily to Italy and very little Italian exports went into China. On top of this, the Italian government at the time was already clashing with the EU, budget deficit being a big arguing point between both of them. Election time promises had raised Italy's budget deficit to 2.4%, which broke agreements with EU that Italy had made earlier. Dealing with the CCP was Italy's way of showing the EU that they have other friends that they are willing to turn to. 
Italy's move also came at a time when EU was trying to tackle China's growing influence in Europe and Africa. Italy's decision seemed like it was undermining the EU's attempt to compete with China's economic might. But four years later, Italy now realizes that BRI was not all that CCP made it out to be. They realized that BRI was just a way for China to help its economy while not providing anything to other countries. So let's quickly go over why China launched BRI and what was CCP's original plan all along. For this, we need to back up a little to 2013. China was one of the fastest growing countries in the world at this point, and it was becoming bigger than just a factory for world's manufacturing. It was a powerful and rich nation, but the future was bleak. Growth was slowing down. The young population that had fueled China's past growth was getting old. And CCP's one-child policy had put a huge dent in China's future population. But this all did not deter the communist government from focusing outwards and growing its power around the world. So Xi Jinping launched the most ambitious project in the history to increase China's influence around the globe. China would give out loans to poor struggling nations in the name of help. But in return, China would gain control over a country's valuable resources or strategic locations. Now you may ask, what if these countries can't pay back the loans? Well, then China would just get control over importer resources like gold, silver, and oil. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get more into this in just a second. Let's get back to the story. Initially, the project was called One Belt and One Road Project. But some countries wonder, why is it named One Belt and One Road? Is it because China would be the only one in control? So, to avoid any misunderstanding, CCP changed the name to Belt and Road Initiative. And the plan began. China's Belt and Road Initiative. BRI is a gigantic plan for a global network of ports, roads, railways, and other infrastructure to connect China to the world. It's also a way through which China confirms its role as a global power. Together, they account for 40% of the global GDP, 65% of the world's population, and 75% of the known energy reserves. China started loaning out billions of dollars to countries all around the world. It had given $12 billion to Sri Lanka, $26 billion to Pakistan, and $3 billion to Tajikistan. In total, it would have given close to a trillion dollars to more than 100 countries, most of them being poor and struggling. So, when these countries default, China is able to get access to valuable resources and spread its influence. It controls power plants and strategic ports in Pakistan, gold and silver mines in Tajikistan, and quite famously, the Hambantoto port in Sri Lanka. We'll talk more about this soon, but first, you guys might be wondering, why would these countries accept loans if they know China's true intentions? Well, unlike what Dave Ramsey says, loans aren't necessarily a bad thing. Now, Things get wildly complicated when you look at a whole economy. So for simplicity purposes, I'll use a simple example for the explanation. Let's say you're a head of a car rental company which has three cars. Right now you're making $1,500 in profit per month renting out cars. Now, let's say someone comes to you and offers to loan you some money so you can buy a fourth car, which can make you another $500 in profit. Now, as long as you use the loan to buy a car like Toyota, whose monthly payment is less than $500, then this is a profitable business move for you as the car will be making more than what the loan payment is. But if you buy a car like Mercedes, which has monthly payment of more than $500, even though the car looks good, it's not really a good business move because now you're actually worse off compared to before you took out the loan you're actually making less profit since now you have to use the profits from other cars to pay off the loan for the Mercedes. Now, a country's economy is a lot more complex than the example I just gave, but the basics are still pretty similar. For any project that's built using the loan, 
As long as the output in GDP is higher than the cost of the loan, the country would consider that loan a good thing. But if the project from the loan doesn't turn out productive, then it's extremely bad news for these developing countries as it pushes their economy even further back. And if China is involved, that just makes things 10 times worse as you learn soon. Now this is why when the World Bank gives out loans to poor countries, they come with conditions. They have to show where the money is going, how it's being used, and if it even makes sense to use that money on certain projects. This helps eliminate or at least limit corruption and malinvestments from these loans. This is why Hamun Toto Port in Sri Lanka was denied the construction by several other lenders because the investment just didn't make sense from an economic standpoint. Sri Lanka already had a thriving port in the capital Colombo. And even though the demand was growing, it was nowhere near close to a point where it would make sense to sink so much money into a new port. China, on the other hand, didn't really care about the feasibility of the port when it loaned out the money to Sri Lanka. In fact, it didn't really care about how money was used in most countries, and it was all by design. You see, China's goal with these loans was not to increase the economic output of the developing nation. No, no, no. Its main goal was to gain influence over its politicians. Politicians who had decision-making powers in the country. Politicians who could sway the public opinion in favor of China. And politicians who could push China's agenda on the international stage. China would just give out loans with no oversight so the politician can use the funds to win elections and stay in power. That's exactly what happened with the Hambantoto port as it was built in then President Rajapaksa's hometown just to win political points with the public. Eventually, the Rajapaksa's family's corruption led to Sri Lanka's thriving economy to bankruptcy and the family fled the country to avoid charges. But, as long as politicians are closing up to China, CCP doesn't really care about how these loans are used. I'm sure that the communist government prefers that these corrupt politicians stay in power as long as possible. When China took over the Hambantoto port, a lot of experts gave them the benefit of doubt and explained that this was purely a business deal to recoup the loan money and China had no plans to turn it into a military naval base. But according to recent news reports, as soon as Sri Lanka goes bankrupt, China tries stationing a military ship in the port and that plan was only delayed because India showed a strong protest against China setting up a military base in India's backyard. China has constantly encroached on India's northern borders and India has no plan on giving in to China's aggressive behavior. But that's the story for another video. Now, the Chinese policy in Africa is often described as a dead trap. At a summit with African leaders, China's president dismissing claims of a new colonialism. It is a part of a deliberate strategy to loan unmanageable sum sums to African countries. Beijing is winning lion's share of construction projects in Africa. A win-win partnership or a debt trap? Now, let's talk about Africa. CCP has used the same tactics on countries in Africa to gain influence over politicians there. This is how China was able to set up a military base in this small but important country, Djibouti. Djibouti controls the axis between the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, one of the busiest maritime trade routes. And now, China has a military base there and a controlling stake in the port that sits right on the choke point. China has also built the headquarters of the African Union in Ethiopia. But Chinese companies left something behind when they finished the projects. They had bought the whole building and its servers. Because of this, CCP always knew what African politicians were discussing and planning. And this way, CCP always had influence over Africa. Johnny Harris has a great video on this that I'll link at the end. But you guys might be wondering, why a Chinese company was building the headquarters for the African Union? Well, this is where we need to look at the terms of these loans that China was giving out. You see, these loans came with a lot of strengths and all of them were in favor of China. One of the most common terms in all these loans is that any project funded by these loans must be given to a Chinese company to build. So, if a country wants to build a port, 
they hire a Chinese company. They want to build a power plant, they hire a Chinese company. And if they want to build a parliament, they hire a Chinese company. This is how the CCP was able to build the African Union parliament. But problems don't just end there. These Chinese companies mostly bring workers from China to work on these projects. Even food for these workers is imported from China. So at the end of the day, most of the money that China is giving out as loan ends up finding its way back to China while these developing countries are stuck holding the bills. Add on to that, a lot of these projects are becoming a non-productive part of the economy. There is the port and airport in Sri Lanka that no one is using. There is another port in Pakistan that's barely used for commercial purposes. And there are thousands of new apartment buildings in Angola that are simply sitting empty. These are just few examples of malinvestments from Chinese loans that are all too common. Big reason behind these failures is that most of the time, there is no demand for these services. But since there is no oversight with these loans, they end up being built anyway. Because of these, these projects add little to no value to the local economies and the loans behind the projects actually take money away from the local budget in form of interest payments and debt repayment. This has turned into a horrible situation for a lot of countries. If we remember our car example, because of these bad investments, countries are now stuck using their money for paying these loans instead of reinvesting that money into actual beneficial projects. Some of these repayment terms on these loans are also a bit aggressive to say the least. Usually, when the World Bank gives out loan, it comes with the interest of 1-3% to and payback period of 30 years. But these Chinese loans come with an interest rate as high as 7% and payback period of only 15 years. Because of this, a lot of struggling countries were unable to make payments and defaulted on their loans. This is when China came up with a solution. It went to the struggling nation and said, hey, since you can't pay back the loan, would you be fine with us just taking over the resource mines and we'll forgive the loan? Or you can just lease us this important port and we will extend the loan so you have more time to pay it back. Or in Angola's case, China got country's oil when the country defaulted on the loans. It even went as far as asking countries to stop recognizing Taiwan as a country and vote in favor of China's agenda during important United Nations votes. And if a country doesn't listen to China, well, then CCP's economic blackmail begins. Lithuania is a perfect example of this. In 2021, Lithuania set up a diplomatic office in Taiwan and invited Taiwan to set up an office in Lithuania under the name Taiwan. This is a big deal. Just for context, usually countries don't let Taiwanese offices use the name Taiwan, so not to anger CCP over their one China policy. It is a common practice for Taiwan to use the name Taipei overseas. But Lithuania let them use the name Taiwan, which didn't please the CCP. So what did the CCP do? Launch an economic blackmail against Lithuania. First, CCP banned all the export and imports to Lithuania. But that didn't really make a difference, since these two countries didn't have a big trade relation to begin with. So, to increase the pressure, CCP started pressuring foreign companies to stop trading with Lithuania. In December 2021, Beijing warned firms that sourced products from Lithuania that they could find their commercial relations with China restricted. Soon after that, it was reported that automotive parts produced by Continental, a major German company that sources components from Lithuania, were unable to clear customs in China. These informal secondary sanctions have also increased the economic price borne by domestic firms in Lithuania. Biggest issue of all this is what China is doing with secondary sanction is a big violation of World Trade Organization rules which China is part of. If China was never accepted into WTO in 2001, then it wouldn't be where it is today economically. And now, China is brazenly just breaking its rules. This is just one of many examples of China bullying other nations, especially the smaller ones. But Lithuania didn't back down and is still going.
Anyways, coming back to the BRI. As the news of China's practices with the loans spread across the world, the countries got more cautious about accepting Chinese help. And some countries went as far as to cancel all the projects they had agreed to already. But that didn't stop the CCP. To avoid bad publicity, CCP started requiring countries to not disclose any loan amount or loan terms to the public. So oftentimes, when a poor government takes on a loan from China, it's quite possible that the country's citizens might not find out about it. Because of its aggressive lending, China became one of the biggest lenders in the world, loaning out close to a trillion dollars. This is where it made a big mistake. It was a bit too aggressive. Due to the aggressive terms, a lot of the countries have started to default and China was not expecting such a high rate so soon. COVID did play a big part in nation not being able to pay these loans. But even before COVID, failure rates on these loans were high. China was often forced to loan out more money to keep countries afloat, as you can see in this chart. Between 2019 and the end of 2021, Beijing granted $104 billion in rescue loans a figure almost as large as China's bailout lending worldwide in previous two decades. This makes you question, why was China helping countries stay afloat after everything we just talked about? Well, because much like in Sri Lanka, if a country defaults, the government is overthrown and China would lose its influence over the corrupt politicians, which it had bribed for so long. Now, every time I mention Sri Lanka on this channel, a lot of people point out that according to official figures, only 10% of Sri Lanka's debt was owed to China. Now, that number may not be correct. As I mentioned earlier, because of bad press, a lot of Chinese loans were lent out in secrecy. On top of that, a good portion of Sri Lanka's loans were owned by Chinese banks. And we have to remember, there is no such thing as a private company in China. CCP has tremendous amount of influence over these banks. Just wanted to clarify that. Now back to the video. One of the worst examples of BRI failure is Pakistan. Pakistan's foreign debt has nearly doubled since 2015 to 100 billion dollars, with Chinese lenders collectively being the largest creditor at around 30 billion dollars. Islamabad spends around half of country's revenue on servicing foreign debt and needed a $3 billion loan from IMF in June to avoid defaulting amid an acute financial crisis. Pakistan isn't alone. Increasing numbers of BRI borrowers are being pushed to the brink of insolvency by a slowdown in global growth, rising interest rate, and record high debt levels in developing world. While the West is trying to figure out a way to restructure these debt, China has been blocking these negotiations. You see, Western countries have something called the Paris Club. It's a group of major creditors whose role is to negotiate debt restructuring when payment difficulties are experienced. Though China is not part of the Paris Club, the organization has invited China to negotiate debts for the struggling countries being that China is now the biggest bilateral lender. But China has always refused to work with other creditors to help struggling countries making it more difficult for other creditors to restructure the debt. China, in fact, wants the Western creditors like the IMF and the World Bank to forgive their debts so the poor countries can repay the Chinese loans. Which is, of course, not good for the struggling countries or the IMF. Only party that benefits is the CCP. First, it was the CCP who gave out unsustainable loans and now it wants others to bail out China. Biggest losers of all this are the developing countries that were just trying to help their citizens. Zambia is a prime example. Of roughly $20 billion of external debt that IMF tallied in 2022, $2.7 billion was lent by international development banks. $1.3 billion comes from various Western governments. Bank loans come to $1.6 billion. Local bond debt comes to $3.3 billion and international dollar bond debt comes to $3.3 billion too. But the biggest chunk is nearly $6 billion or to China. 
the IMF has reached a support agreement with Zambia that is conditional on its debt burden becoming sustainable. But China refuses to agree to the terms, making it impossible to restructure Zambia's debt. In the meantime, Zambia says it has accumulated about $1.2 billion in arrears since default. And that number is only growing. Unfortunately, Zambia's situation is not unique. Currently, 15% of the countries in the world are in debt distress, and half of the countries in the world are at a high risk of falling into it. All because China wanted more influence across the world. Luckily, other global powers saw CCP's true motive with the BRI early on and launched their own initiative to counter CCP's ambitions. US launched the International Development Finance Corporation in 2018. And then at G7 meeting in 2021, President Biden launched a Build Back Better World initiative, repackaged next year as the Partnership for Global Infrastructure Investment. The European Union in 2021 launched its Global Gateway, which aims to leverage up a relatively modest amount of public money to fund 300 billion euros of investment in connectivity projects over six years. Then lastly, India launched its own investment fund to get out of CCP's encirclement of important Indian trade routes. Let's go over all these one by one. Let's start with the US program. In 2021, the G7 Forum launched its own infrastructure project to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. The so-called Build Back Better World, B3W in short, would provide hundreds of billions of dollars to underdeveloped countries. The idea was that the project would help with financing global infrastructure projects by giving out loans with low interest rates. Africa, with its huge infrastructure gap, was supposed to be at the core of this program. The reason for starting the B3W appears to be simple. Countries like the United States, Canada, or the United Kingdom didn't want to stay behind on the huge investments that China was making. And similarly to the Global Gateway, this new B3W program was value-driven. The forum wanted to focus on sustainability, transparency, gender equality, and climate change. The G7 argued that this value-driven approach is what separated BTW program from its BRI counterpart. The focus on quality loans and not just the quantity of them could lead to better results. But to make an impact on a huge infrastructure gap in underdeveloped countries, you need a lot of money. The estimates are that Africa needs $100 billion annually to tackle its infrastructure deficit. And G7 isn't unaware of this. But even G7, as powerful as it is, can't easily provide this kind of money. That's one of the reasons why BTW projects never really took off. The program stayed really vague and it hasn't competed with China's BRI in any way. The fact that entire BTW project was renamed after one year says a lot. In 2022, the US started a brand new and a game-changing project with its G7 allies. Keep in mind, this was just one year after the Build Back Better World program was launched. The 2022 version was called Program for Global Infrastructure and Investment, PG2 in short. This new program is mostly the same as B3W, just packaged under a different name. The United States aims to mobilize $200 billion by 2027, and together with other G7 partners, it will mobilize $600 billion. Much of the funding will have to come from private sector. The G7 won't actually provide these huge sum of money themselves, but instead, it looks at banks and investment firms to help out. Whether this will work out, who knows? In China, the government can force its bank to help the Belt and Road Initiative. But whether the US can access capital this way is well questionable. Nevertheless, it is clear that the United States and its allies are seeing the potential that underdeveloped countries, and especially Africa, have. The G7 is trying to invest in the African continent to reduce the infrastructure gap and to gain more influence. The United States is also starting to realize just how important Africa will be in the future. Washington is not only investing in the infrastructure through PG2, but it's also looking to expand mutual trade relations. With Prosper Africa Initiative, multiple U.S. government agencies are working together to achieve this goal. 
The project is connecting U.S. businesses to African markets by providing helpful services. With the initiative, the U.S. government wants to spark private investments, import and exports with the African continent through the private sector. For example, it has helped a Texas company win a contract with the government of Ghana. If the United States succeeds in getting the private sector on board, it will help with competing against China. The U.S. government can launch massive programs as efficiently as the authoritarian CCP, but it does have its good old capitalism and very powerful businesses. If the United States can convince its businesses to help win influence in Africa, the BRI has a serious competitor. Apart from the US, the EU and China, there are many other players looking to invest in Africa. For example, India and the UAE are combining their forces to invest in African infrastructure. Singapore is also strategically investing and building up trade relationships with the continent. And other countries like South Korea, Japan, the United Kingdom are doing exactly the same. Let's talk about the EU for a minute. The European Union responded to the Chinese plans by launching its own program. With the Global Gateway Investment Package, the EU wants to help underdeveloped countries by developing digital, transportation, and infrastructure networks. Until 2027, the European Union will mobilize up to 300 billion euros for its global project, of which 150 billion euros will go to the African countries. Obviously, the European Union started this program as a response to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. After China started the multi-trillion dollar infrastructure project, the EU couldn't just sit ideally and do nothing in response. But Many criticize the Global Gateway Project for being nothing more than a PR stunt. 300 billion euros is nowhere near the amount that China has invested. It will be hard for Europe to compare against the Chinese investments. Apart from the differences in size, the EU project also has some different goals than its Chinese counterpart. China's sales pitch is building roads, bridges, and railways. All of that fast and cheap but Europe's global gateway is focused more on sustainability and providing green energy solution. The program doesn't only concentrate on hard infrastructure, but also on soft infrastructure like healthcare and education systems. The critics of the project say that this approach won't work in Africa. Underdeveloped countries in Africa want to get a lot of infrastructure fast and cheap. Whether it's sustainable or not, they don't care. And they have had enough of aid packages. They want to solve the underlying problem, which is the economic underdevelopment. But in some cases, the European approach with quality projects over sheer quantity of them may actually reap some benefits. As we talked earlier, there are numerous Chinese infrastructure projects in Africa failing due to poor planning and execution. The standard gauge railway in Tanya is an example of this. A multi-billion dollar railway project aimed to connect Uganda and Kenya with each other has failed dramatically. The railway project was stopped before it even crossed the Ugandan border because the Kenya government couldn't pay the Chinese debt anymore. The Kenyan government racked up a total of $4.7 billion in debt from this railway alone. And that's with a GDP of just $110 billion. Think about that. Racking up more than 4% of your GDP in debt for one incomplete railway. Adding to this, the railway itself wasn't a feasible idea either. During the first three years of operation, the project lost $200 million. The railway still bleeds cash, even when it's operational. The reasons for this disaster vary from corruption to poor planning. This example is very telling. Sometimes the big shiny project turn out to be a terrible mistakes. The European Union, however, focuses on smaller and more sustainable projects, which gives it an advantage. From constructing six small hydropower plants in Nigeria to constructing a solar energy plant in Djibouti, Europe can make some small impacts with this program. And Europe does have some larger projects under the global gateway. For example, it's constructing a subsea power cable from Egypt to Greece to transmit renewable energy from Africa to Europe. The cost of the project is estimated to be around 900 million euros, 
And for Africa, working together with Europe certainly has its advantages. Africa leaders that value sustainability and don't want to end up with failed Chinese projects could turn to Europe instead. But the problem is that Europe doesn't have much capital. With the six-year-long global gateway, the European Union is already struggling to scramble 300 billion euros for the funding of the projects. A lot of money needs to come from the private sector because the governments simply do not have the resources. There are several reasons for this. Big one being that the economy of the European Union is smaller than that of China. The EU's economy amounts to around $16 trillion in GDP, while China has a nominal GDP of around $19 trillion. At least that's what it reports publicly. Like I've said in previous videos, China's GDP figures are well disputed to say the least. If you want the full video, you can go check it out. What it comes down to is that China's GDP numbers could be much lower than expected. So China's advantage in GDP numbers could be minimal or even non-existent. Nevertheless, the European Union has one more disadvantage when it comes to these huge investment programs. Many see European Union as a slow and bureaucratic organization. This is because it is a union with tons of different member states. Every single country needs to agree on every single policy it makes. When you're trying to organize billions of euros for a project like Global Gateway, it becomes hard to execute. The plan needs to go through several committees and councils, which is a process that can take months to complete. There are a lot of political differences within the European Union, something that doesn't make cooperation go very smoothly. In China, however, this is a whole lot different. China has an autocratic government in which Xi Jinping holds all the power. Now, this has a lot of disadvantages when it comes to things like civil rights and democratic values. And I'm not arguing that an autocratic government is any good, but a foreign investment program like Belt and Road Initiative is much easier to execute for dictatorships. Remember, the CCP indirectly controls a lot of Chinese banks, so it has access to tons of money. Xi Jinping can access billions of dollars without having to go through the same procedures as the EU. On top of that, Xi has control over a lot of Chinese businesses, so he can direct his resources top down. And with his one-party state, Xi isn't going to have opposition against his investment plans. You can see why European Union is having a hard time competing against China. But that doesn't mean the global gateway isn't a headache for Chinese BRI. Definitely is. Lastly, we have India, who has become quite a thorn in CCP's way. To contain India, China has built pipelines both in Myanmar and Pakistan, from coast to intercity China. It has also secured long port leases in Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Similarly, China has also set up a military base in Djibouti to control a vital strait off the coast of Djibouti that links the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean. All the Asian exports bound for the Western markets must first pass through this vital strait before reaching the Suez Canal. Between 12 to 20% of all global trade passes through this strait only 8 miles from China's space in Camp Lemur. After seeing all the moves China has been making, a lot of military experts have pointed out that the Belt and Road is not just a geo-economic plan. It also has a military strategic advantage. The ports have increasingly come to play a potentially more menacing role as dual-use ports that can give the strengthened Chinese Navy a global reach it lacked entirely just a few years ago. These strategic investments are nicknamed the String of Pearls, as the goal is to encircle India and put pressure on New Delhi. India was aware of this already, but the war in Ukraine showed every country in the world how important it is to secure your economic interests. In modern world, wars can be won and lost before even stepping a foot on the battlefield. India realized that in the case of a war, China's string of pearls can be used as a way to choke off India's access to the world. Adding to this, countries that received Chinese money were slow to criticize China whenever it would encroach on Indian borders. There is also a rumor that China plans to start setting up military bases in countries that received Chinese loans. And of course, 
This was undoubtedly stressful for New Delhi as it didn't want to be surrounded by Chinese military. So India started laying out its own plan to safeguard its economic interests. But it didn't just stop there. Later in the video, we'll go over how India is taking advantage of China's trade war with the USA to hurt China where it's the strongest, its manufacturing prowess. But first, let's go over how India is countering China's military. To counter the string of pearls, India started its own alliances to encircle China, nicknamed the Necklace of Diamonds. India is expanding its naval bases and is also improving relations with strategically placed countries to counter China's strategies. In 2018, India partnered with Singapore and Indonesia to get access to their naval bases of Changi and Sabang. This increased India's influence and access to Strait of Malacca, one of the most important choke points for China and rest of the world in terms of trade. That same year, India also got access to Port of Dukum in Oman. The port facilitates India's crude imports from the Persian Gulf. In addition to this, Indian facility is located right next to the two important Chinese pearls, Djibouti in Africa and Gwadar in Pakistan. India has also signed an agreement with Seychelles for a naval base in the region, which increases India's presence near the African continent. While doing this, India has also extended credit lines to Iran and agreed to build a port in the country to extend access to trade routes in the Central Asia. Additionally, India has extended credit lines in Central Asia to countries like Mongolia, where Prime Minister Modi has agreed to develop a bilateral air corridor. New Delhi has invested a lot in policies to improve relationships with Japan and Vietnam. These relationships have helped increase Indian trade and consequently India's influence on countries around China. India has already started putting its economic growth to good use. It's now lending money to neighbors in order to avoid having them indebted to Chinese loans. It has given $8 billion to Bangladesh, $2.1 billion to Belar Sri Lanka, $1.7 billion to Nepal, and $13 billion to Maldives. While India lags far behind China in overseas lending, New Delhi has stepped up its effort in recent years. Providing tens of billions of dollars in credit to neighboring countries, Indian companies have also expanded rapidly in the region, providing a counterweight to Chinese commercial activity. Indian policymakers see countering the BRI as vital to avoid being surrounded by pro-Chinese governments and infrastructure they speculate could one day serve Beijing's military interest. India has definitely stepped up its efforts in containing China. India publicly downplays the competition with China, but its actions show India doesn't want to be held hostage to China's economic or military might. On top of all this, India has also formed two partnerships with the USA that's scaring China. First, we have IMEC and the second is Quad. Let's go into both one by one. Just back in September, India, European Union, United States and Saudi Arabia announced a mega deal to establish the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor IMEC. The IMEC is composed of two distinct pathways the East Corridor linking India to Middle East and the Northern Corridor connecting Middle East to Europe. This expansive network incorporates a railway system, a hydrogen pipeline and high capacity optical fiber cables. It supplements existing maritime and land-based transport routes such as the Suez Canal, the North-South Transport Corridor and China's Silk Routes, thereby facilitating smooth transit between India, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel and Europe. Given Indian railway industry's proficiency in constructing railway network in arid regions, it is poised to secure a significant portion of contracts from this proposed corridor. The initiative is anticipated to achieve a 40% reduction in time required for transporting Indian goods to Europe. Additionally, it is expected to result in a 30% decrease in the cost of transporting Indian goods to Europe. For the US, this project accomplishes the objective of distancing India from Russia, Iran and China. For India, this appears to be a well-defined strategy aimed at challenging China's extensive Belt and Road projects. 
major blow to China is the fact that Italy, which just withdrew from BRI, has opted into INEC. Last but not least, the second project that India and US are part of is the Quad. US, India, Japan and Australia form the alliance nicknamed Quad. The Quad is seen as a security-focused grouping structured to deter Chinese aggression, whether it be BRI-related or not. Following its reconstitution, the Quad formed working groups in 2021 focused on issues of utmost importance, including vaccines, infrastructure, climate change, critical and emerging technologies, cybersecurity, and humanitarian assistance. This signals the Quad's commitment to delivering real results to regional partners beyond security concerns. This doesn't mean that Quad is not security focused at all. Quad regularly performs military exercises to help establish and enhance interoperability between capable naval forces and aligned operating procedures for emergency response. Every time Quad holds a military exercise, China is quick to denounce it, saying it hurts China's safety. But in reality, the Quad has played a big role in deterring Chinese aggression. By harnessing ambiguity, the Quad can endure and grow as a reliable source of public good, contributing to regional prosperity and keeping great power tensions at a manageable level. All this combined has created quite an issue for BRI and CCP as a whole.